Hello, everyone, and welcome to Diversity Forum with Carney Sanho. Um, my co-presenter, Dot Koal, and I are here and looking forward to spending some time with you. Um, we are both college counselors and have some other hats in our schools, and I'll let Dot introduce herself in a moment. But we wanted to, uh, while we're waiting for some other people to come into our room, um, if you wouldn't mind checking in with us and in the chat, um, tell us your name and what school you're from and hashtag, how are you feeling? Hashtag, how are you feeling? We'd love to hear how you're doing right now. We know that everybody's school is in different uh, stages of um, learning as far as are you in person? Are you hybrid? Are you um, uh, totally virtual? And uh, just how are you feeling in general? So please enter that into the chat for us. Thank you, Martha. We see you. Yes, feeling significantly better since noon yesterday. I hear that. Yes. Laura, hi. Um, feeling good. Day two of in-person classes. That's awesome. Hi, Rice. Feeling inspired. Excellent. Thank you. Feeling inspired after yesterday. Dot. Yep. Snaps. Annalise, feeling optimistic. Thank you. Hi, Jennifer. Hashtag hopeful. Awesome. Tiana, hashtag feeling good. Hi, Wes. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Nick, hashtag exhale. I hear you. <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit of that myself. Hi, B. You're hybrid, empowered. Oh, I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Thanks. Hashtag keep showing up. Absolutely. That's all any of us can do every day. We're showing up for our students. So um, thank you for all that you do. And we are here with you in this together. Awesome. So my name is Joy Gray Prince. I am the Director of College Counseling at Atlanta Girls School. I've been in admission and college counseling for over 15 years. Um, most of my career has been in Atlanta, although I am a native New Yorker. The New Yorker in me will always be in me, but I have been Atlanta. I've been in Atlanta for years, um, although I'm not a native, they try to make me one, so I just will um, do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll claim Atlanta. Um, and I've been um, at a couple of different schools in college counseling in the Atlanta area. I'm I'm also um, co-facilitator of the DEI work that we do at Atlanta Girls School, and I am holding it down for um, our interim, as an interim middle school dean uh, right now this year um, through the end of this academic year. Um, Atlanta Girls School is a single gender school uh, in Atlanta grades 6 through 12. We are just shy of 200 students. And Dot, introduce yourself. Thanks, Joy. Hi, everyone. I'm Dot Cowell. Uh, I am currently the Director of College Counseling at Sonoma Academy um, out here in Fire Country, Santa Rosa, California. Um, I'm also uh, the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in its interim year. Uh, so it's the first year we've ever had the position. Um, and with a new head of school, it's currently interim. Um, a lot of work to do, though. And, uh, you know, been in college counseling 10 plus years, um, college and academic and personal counseling. And uh, and yeah, but have been passionate about the DEI work since the beginning. And so Dot and I met at a leadership conference in 2019 and we were one of uh, a few college counselors. And so we connected and we just talked about our roles and it was what it was like at our schools. And we decided to just stay connected. You know how you meet people at conferences and then you don't always uh, uh, catch up after or connect with those people. We made a point to connect. And I was looking back through my emails Dot and I think you reached out to me uh, first via email and say, you know, let's talk. And so we had a conversation about college counseling in our schools and what our hopes were for the future and how we might want to grow um, in college counseling and even more in our schools. So that's what started us on this uh, path for 
holding each other accountable um, for the things that we wanted to do. And Dot will say, Dot emailed a couple uh, last year and said, hey, I'm putting our name in for this session. So um, we started working together and, and trying to do some sessions. And that's how um, this session came about. Dot, do you want to take over and share a little bit more? Um, yeah. So. You know, the other reason Joy and I connected, we were we connected at the Heads Network, which is a conference for women who might see themselves as head of school one day or even just senior leaders, senior administrators. Um, and, you know, the other thing that Joy, Joy and I have in common is just being women of color in independent school leadership, as well as often wearing multiple hats at our institutions, which often you know, it happens to all of us. But you know, when you go to conferences like POCC and they ask you to stand up if you have more than two roles at your institution, I would say nearly everyone stands up. That's right, awesome. Thank you, Dot. Uh, so we decided to really think about our roles in a, with a different lens, and that is a DEI lens, and how we infuse and integrate those roles together and how we serve our students. Um, and that's why the title of our, our presentation today is College Counselors as DEI Change Agents. Um, so if you could um, advance the slide, Dot. Yeah, let me share screen. Wonderful. And I think we're, there we go. So we wanted to start out with some norms and I love that we call these uh, dot, you shared this new term, brave space agreements. So if we could all come through this lens, um, make sure that we are listening to one another, we're looking for opportunities to learn, um, examine what you think you know, and then listen with intent, um, take an opportunity to learn something and then please keep what you learn in this session um, confidential. We might share uh, information about our schools and we just want to be able to share this uh, with you and make sure that it stays where it needs to. Um, so please hold tightly to our norms and brave space agreements um, that you can advance. And today, we, our schools are very different. Um, Dots is co-ed, mine is um, single gender. Um, all of your schools are very different where you're located. Um, and so we won't come out necessarily with, this is what you need to do in your office. What we're hoping for is that you'll be able to take something from what we have done in our offices and perhaps uh, adopt it for your own. So um, today we'd like to talk a little bit about our offices in college counseling as being mission driven uh, and to identify and, uh, and gather info on the students and the families that we're working with uh, and to answer some questions. For example, are we serving all of our students and families equitably or equally? Um, and then what are the populations that we serve? And then what type of programming do we introduce in our offices to serve all students? And then what are sort of resources do you need in order to support the different populations that you're working with? Um, and we will share some resources at the end. Dot. Awesome. Thanks, Joy. So this is a fun picture. This is this could represent so many things right now, um, including kind of the brain around educating in um, our spaces during a pandemic. But I share this because this is how I think a lot of teenagers feel about the college process, the college application process, is that it's not linear. Um, it's very complicated and it's hard to do alone. And so we're going to do a quick poll right now. Um, if you could answer how many hours total throughout the entire college process do you spend with the typical college bound student? And you can see your choices here. Um, and this is over the whole process. It could be from junior to senior year, just senior year. And I think that we probably assume that most people would be college counselors. There could be um, other um, lead, school leaders that might not be able to answer these questions, but it's food for thought to for, perhaps if, if you're an upper school director, um, you might have these conversations with your director of college counseling or college counseling team. Yeah, and, and, and estimate, you know, how much do we think we're doing? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Wes, guesstimate, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we're looking, you know, 10, 10 and up mostly. Okay, I think, um, okay to end poll there, Nick. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, all righty here. So there's a foundation called College Access for All. Some of you may be familiar with um, the book Hold Fast to Dreams written by Josh Steckel and Beth Zaslov. Um, it's a great book. It's in our resource padlet at the end, but um, he brought this to my attention in terms of the time spent, right? And so if we do have an equity lens, we can see that what we can offer our students as I think mostly all independent schools here is, you know, roughly 10, more than 10 times more, you know, the average student is getting across the country around all types of schools. Um, and so given that we're spending that much time and I know a lot of, you know, I know it's a guesstimate and I also know sometimes it feels like it needs to be much more and also, you know, we have our own limitations in terms of size of department. So given that part of college counseling, I think at the majority of our schools is about supporting the individual student, we need to think about who needs what, right? And so these are just general questions I think you can take back to your department. Um, or if you're a department of one, maybe you're taking it back just for yourself to marinate on, right? Um, you, do we have a department mission statement overall, right? But does part of the mission statement specifically address the needs of your most vulnerable populations? And who do you share this mission statement with and why? And so I wanted to share with you at Sonoma Academy, uh, we have a fairly robust cohort of full scholarship, first gen students, all of whom who identify as Latinx. And so they're awarded a full ride through uh, that covers everything, more than just tuition and fees. During COVID, um, everyone has been feeling more vulnerable. I imagine that you're, you're experiencing that students, um, I don't know, I am experiencing that students have sort of this like COVID amnesia where they're not remembering things, um, they're not showing up to meetings as promptly, and kind of as a result feeling like they have more need. And so what happened at Sonoma Academy is that our cohort of, we call them Davis Scholars, in the senior year came to my partner and I and said, hey, we need more from you. And we, you know, we held a meeting and we talked it through. And rather than be reactionary, you know, we, we absorbed all the information and entered in further conversations with them. And the result of that, the reason why I'm sharing that is this is our statement that came out of it that we shared. So I'm just gonna read it. Um, I know you can all read the screen, but so as a department, we are responsible for supporting our first gen high need and BIPOC college bound students in applying to college, including financial aid applications because the system of higher education is so difficult that it requires extra help on top of the regular help provided within the general college counseling exploratory impact curriculum for anyone without generational, social, educational, and monetary capital to easily navigate the right to an education. So this is our specific mission statement as related to our most vulnerable populations. And it was important for us to pull this out with the help of our kids and in language that they clearly understand that we, we understand why there is more need, that they do need more help. It's not because they're deficient in any way. It's because of these pieces of capital that they, they don't have access to. And Dot, let me ask a question. Did that inform um, how much time you and your, your colleague decided to spend um, with your students? Did that help inform a decision whether to increase that amount of time? Yeah. You know, uh, we're lucky enough that our caseloads are small that it really is, they're, they're sort of like an open container of the amount of time that you can have with us. 
I think what came out of this conversation is that they wanted more proactive reach out and more proactive reach out to their parents. And so um, that does equate to more time. We didn't like break it down numerically. Okay. I see the second poll is up. Yep. Second poll is up. If um, y'all want to answer some of this, this is going to be getting to our next point. Okay. So this is more about what is the information that you know? What, what do you already understand about your populations? Okay. All right. This is really interesting. Okay. So about half, half, right. On understanding who might be first gen, mm -hmm. um, really most may not understand who might have undocumented parents and who are undocumented, but the financial aid and need is mm -hmm. likely easier information for all of us to get. Okay. Um, all right, Nick, it's okay to stop the poll now or I can perhaps click out of it. Okay. I'll say, um, this is Martha Newbert. I'll say that um, just to, on that poll, I, I might know or somebody might know, but it's not because it's collected information, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's anecdotal, uh, certainly about the undocumented piece. So it's not because we have a metric or a check a box oh, for sure. any of that. That's all sort of uh, relationship and human work, mm -hmm. um, which presents another set of issues, but mm -hmm. thanks. Absolutely. All right, Joy. Um, it, oh. Okay, so in thinking about who are your most vulnerable populations and um, do you have first generation students? Who are your high need students? Who are your BIPOC students? And what are the intersectionalities of these um, different populations that you have at your schools? Um, and are, is there a way to define those terms? Because what certainly I don't, is define how a student sees yourself, herself, how she self-identifies. So it's always really important uh, for me to, when I get to know a student or a family, to figure out how they identify, how the student identifies. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about information gathering because like Martha said, there is not necessarily this information that's documented, a place where I can go and click and say, okay, this is what I know. Um, it takes some effort to connect the dots and get information. And then we may have to get uh, work with several different offices on campus to get the information that we need to help our students. So we'll talk a little bit about more about what that looks like for our campuses. Um, across departments, again, ensure that there is shared language and fluency. And I always want to make sure that I am keeping um, students um, information private um, and family information private. So I try to be very careful about um, what I share and the information that I request and making sure that I'm following school protocols to make sure uh, that everything stays um, in house. And then um, defining needs, of course, how much time does this student need? Um, what, is the what are the financial aid parameters or barometers that you need to uh, figure out with each student? Is there any need for language translation? And, and Dot, I know that you have some stories about that. Um, do they need, do students need extra emotional support? Um, and are there logistical explanations? And that could be, you know, our students come from 60 different zip codes. And so making sure that I understand, okay, well, this student might not be able to have in her application her college application that she does X amount of activities because she has to travel an hour from uh, an Atlanta suburb um, and with traffic, it could even be longer. So her time is spent getting to school and from school and not necessarily participating in a lot of activities. And I'm just gonna jump in here real quick, Joy. You know, when we, we talk about defining terms, you know, even the, the, the term first gen, right? Are, do we mean first gen college bound? Do we mean first generation in independent schools? You know, does it count, right? If your parents went to college in their home country, but as immigrants have not been able to capitalize on that level of education here. Um, so, so what does it, is, is everyone sharing the same definition? And the same thing goes, you know, for BIPOC or sort of self-identified uh, race. You know, the NAIS uh, recent study shows that the highest number um, 
in terms of diverse populations, the largest group that's growing the most is people who I self-identify as multiracial. But then the group that surpasses that is the group that clicks, I'm not sure. So, um, you know, we're seeing that the students themselves don't even necessarily understand sort of the terms, right, that are, that are being used around them. Um, so I think we actually have done the slide 10 dot so we can move oh, forward. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, that's okay. You know, I'd really like for you to share, did you want to share about, um, and you might have it in a different area of the, of the slide, but would this be a good time to talk about the language gathering and what you all did in, at Sonoma to help make sure that your Spanish speaking families could understand all the work that you're doing? Yeah, so right now, um, and I'll talk more in depth about it later, but you know, just because kids in our Davis cohort are Latinx, we didn't wanna assume that all of their families needed a level of Spanish translation for our communications or events. So you know, at the top of every year, when we get a new cohort in, we'll assess at that time at the beginning, who would prefer, so not even who needs to have, but who would prefer translation. And if there is even, if there's at least one person, um, then we, you know, put some money behind resources to make sure that uh, we have translators in meetings as well as um, some other tools we have for events and communications that I'll touch on later. Thank you. Uh, so how do we gather information? And um, Susan, that's a great point that you put some, some students don't believe that they're first generation if there's a sibling already in college or graduated from college before they did. Um, absolutely. So I tend to think um, when working with my students that if the parents did not attend college then they are considered first generation. Um, so that's kind of the premise that I work with. Dot, is that the same for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so some of the things that um, you can go back a slide dot some of the things that I have done um, working in, in my offices, especially when it comes down to students asking for fee waivers and IT fee waivers and um, college application fee waivers and I'll talk a little bit more in depth after but um, I do have to be, be in close, close contact with the admission and business offices, uh, I'd like to and that information is so confidential and I understand that, but when I put all the, lay the cards out um, on the table for the leadership at Atlanta Girls School, I'll say, you know, well, this student is asking for this. And I want to really, it's, it's about equity. Um, and I, at my school, we are 60% students of color, uh, but that doesn't mean that all those students of color are high need. So I want to be really careful and uh, as equitable as I can in determining where what the need is and so for me that is what percentage of financial aid is a student on and how can i help a student if if, if she needs support with her college applications um, if you look at the sat and act fee waivers um, there are very strict regulations and a lot of times it's uh being on free and reduced lunch, which we don't have any students on free and reduced lunch so our students won't qualify for sat act fee waivers however their financial situation might preclude, preclude them from uh, being able to submit, you know, 10 fees for 10 different college applications. So I do check in with the business office to find out, okay, are these students on financial aid? What are the percentages? And not even, you know, so much as tell me how much financial aid they get. Again, it's a percentage of financial aid because that helped me determine a little bit better um, how I could help a student with fee waivers. Um, the Dean of Students is also whatever it is in your school, it could be the upper school director, it could be the grade level Dean, it could be the Dean of Students. What types of conversations are you having to get that anecdotal information that you need to support students and families? And of course, um, in college counseling, to get to know families at the beginning, we do student surveys. Early Excuse for me. Addison And it could be that uh, you can be very direct in your 
survey and ask, are you first generation college or did your, or a better way actually would be, um, I found to say, where did your parents go to college? Um, and if you don't feel comfortable, that might be in a, putting that in a survey, that could be just a conversation with you have, that you have with a student or a family. Um, and the point is, uh, we have in this slide, we do have to ask, we have to be able to gather that information. Okay, so one of the things that was really important to me, students started coming and saying, um, can you help me with waivers? How do I determine um, who can receive a fee waiver? And I didn't want to be the one just randomly deciding. I wanted there to be a system. I wanted there to be a way that if someone asked me, well, how many fee waivers did a student get? And why did this student get fee waivers and this student different didn't? So I wanted to make sure that I had a, a, a way to be able to track and have a clear way to determine um, fee waivers. As I mentioned, you can always check eligibility requirements for SAT and ACT. Those are the standardized tests that um, everyone knows that students use for college. Um, sometimes, you know, those requirements, our students don't fit any of those requirements, so they won't uh, get fee waivers for either of those tests. However, college application fees can be waived, uh, and you do have to provide um, reasoning for why that student might need a fee waiver. So um, I did confirm with the leadership at my school um, on what we could do. Um, and I came up with what I think is simple um, and maybe you can adapt it for your office. But for example, I went to the business office and I said, if we only have a maximum amount of tuition that we offer students who are on aid, um, how can I kind of look at those numbers and figure out how much um, financial, uh, how many fee waivers that we might be able to give. Doc, can you scroll down just a little? So if you see in column C, I'm sorry, go back up. Column C, at the top of column C, I have put um, the amount of fee, the amount of um, tuition assistance that a student receives. And then the next column is, do they qualify for a fee waiver? Um, can I offer them a fee waiver based on that and the number of fee waivers I can give them? And then a little bit lower, you see if um, I kind of put it in categories based on where the students, where the class fell. I think that this is something that I have to redo every year, um, depending on how much financial aid is actually given. My school, um, every, every student can, Students can only receive or families can only receive up to 75% of tuition assistance. So as you see my categories are if they get 65% or more, then they're eligible for 10, um, between 50 and 64%, um, five fee waivers and 49 and below fee, three fee waivers. So I made sure that I uh, checked this with admissions and with the business office and with the upper school director and with the head of school to make sure everyone was on board and everyone think that that um, well to be able to offer students um, fee waivers based on their need. That, anything to add? Uh, no, this looks great. Okay. Okay. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about, so, so we just talked a little bit about just need, right? And uh, when I think about the most vulnerable populations um, at my school, it's really about the undocumented population or the children of, of parents who are undocumented. So I just, you know, when at my previous schools, I didn't have, I'd never worked with an undocumented family before. And so it was really important for me to understand sort of the terminology and sort of the laws. And that's hard because they're constantly changing um, as we know throughout the Trump presidency um, and will change again. So just in terms of definition, right? When we say undocumented, um, this is what comes up as sort of the, the legal definitions, right? Um, you entered into the US without inspection or with fraudulent documentation or entered as a non-immigrant with proper doc documentation and then overstated the terms of your status and remained in the US without authorization. There is no federal or state law that prohibits the admission of undocumented immigrants to US colleges, public or private. And that is something that I really um, need to express really intentionally to our families because many of them actually think that they're breaking the law by doing so. 
And then I just wanted to add in um, sort of these definitions for the DREAM Act and DACA, because I feel like they're thrown out a lot. Um, and because you can go to several websites, you know, this is for DACA, this is for the DREAMers, and sometimes I think they are conflated. And we have a lot more in terms of uh, definitions and protocols for these students in our Padlet that we'll share with you at the end. So this is our last poll. So in terms of time, how many hours total through the entire college process do you spend with your most vulnerable students who wish to apply to college? And yeah, it is hard, it's hard to guesstimate. <laughs> So right now, again, looking at um, with about half people responding 10 to 15, okay. Oops, all right, let me go back to the presentation. Okay, so I just want you to think about um, I want you to think about the time spent, right? Because when we don't do that, we have to be everything to everybody. And so our hope, you know, Joy and my hope from this presentation is that you can take away some things that can just become sort of rote, you know, and procedural so that you're not reinventing um, the wheel every time a high needs student comes along because at least for, for us and our institutions, we can sort of anticipate the category of need or vulnerability. Um, so part of the, the way I think about the college counseling support at Sonoma Academy is support to and through for these students. So for the students um, for whom attending college is sort of, uh, you know, wasn't necessarily an expectation in the family, right? Um, but they, they made it, they did it, getting through college even harder. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of the support timeline um, before enrollment. And it'll probably look a lot like what you do. Um, so in the junior spring, going across departments and really identifying who your most vulnerable students and parent populations are. You know, including very specific survey questions, right? Um, about citizenship with a verbal follow-up. That way we can get away from just asking the citizenship question based on who we sort of stereotype might not have citizenship. If something comes forward, right, either verbally, um, or yeah, just in passing, we try to keep all of this off email, that we do find out a certain family is undocumented or a parent. We follow up with a family appointment, clarifying steps that are different for these students. We also always offer a translator for, for these appointments. We also wanna clarify the support systems in place and process for the parents and that is a direct request from our students that we have more direct education about college process to the parents. Senior fall, senior spring, right? A lot of financial aid support. So three years ago, it became clear that that was really the hardest part of the journey from, from our you know, high, high need populations. So, what we do is we offer um, sort of on retainer a financial aid consultant that meets with these families regularly starting in September. And we are there, the, the other college counselor and I are there for that initial meeting. And then afterwards they meet as needed moving forward. So for an undocumented student, you know, this person is helping them uh, with the 
the Dreamer application for California, um, also giving them estimated ideas of what colleges might give them um, because they can still qualify for our state aid, which is the Cal grant. Um, this is a budgeted resource. You can imagine that this is this costs a lot, right? And so this had to be taken up to administration uh, about the why it's needed um, to support our program. And that, mm -hmm. go ahead. Um, the other thing that comes up a lot, right? Um, if you've ever worked with a very high need student is that typically those kids are flagged to provide that IDOC additional documentation after the FAFSA and the CSS profile. So um, we support them through that with the help of the financial consultant. Um, we try to take the stress away, right? Like this isn't, it's no big deal. We'll get through it, you know, um, because I think it is scary to feel like um, something's missing, right? That something more is needed from you. And of course, you know, supporting deciphering the financial aid awards when those letters start to come in. Um, do this. Dot, we also had a question in the chat. How do you provide translators? Do you mm -hmm. contract them? Do you ask or compensate world language teachers? Mm -hmm. So for our, for our specific school, we did have a world language teacher, our Spanish teacher who wanted this role. So she, it is a stipended role where she helps us translate emails as well as transcripts for our college night videos because now they're all on video um, during COVID. And so it is a, it is a budgeted resource. Um, the other thing in terms of translation, when we had on-campus events, which now feels like forever ago, um, and I have this resource on the Padlet, we had a device, um, headphone device for families who needed the translation. And then we had the translator in the booth uh, in our auditorium. And so she would translate in real time what we were saying and then, um, the parents could hear it through their headphones concurrently. And that person, I, you know, we switch. We have some people on our faculty who will do that sometimes, but sometimes it's not possible, especially for evening events. And we've been lucky enough in these cases with some parent volunteers. And just to follow up, do you have the translator in family meetings as well? Yes, if, if it is requested. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing in the senior fall spring is just completing all necessary steps to enroll, pick classes, housing. I don't know how many of you have done this already, but you know, I helped a student pick her classes for NYU last year and it was so challenging. It was so complicated. And you know, what would happen is by the time she entered her third class, the first class would have already been gone, right? So it would have already been filled up. Um, but I can't stress enough that um, these things need to be budgeted if they are part of our mission. Um, the expectation is not that the college counselor can do all of this. Okay, so now we're getting to the, you know, the timeline through, right? So through college, after enrollment and through college. So we do have a family meeting um, for all of our sort of anyone who wants to be there, right? Where we talk about the financial aid, healthcare, release of information, things like that. And um, I'm not gonna share it right now because I'm looking at the clock, but uh, I do have sort of a template for what we go through and the things that we touch on. More importantly, we have um, a program we call the Nudge Program. It might benefit from a better name, <laughs> but it's a cross department connection program for our kids um, after they graduate. And I am gonna show you this because I also feel like it might be helpful for you to either copy this template or, or edit it. As you can see, I've made up some students, uh, Steve Kerr, um, Lady Gaga, you know, the huge. Um, and these are the touch points, right? that we wanna make sure we check in with these kids while they're in college, right? So immunization paperwork, what have you, you can kind of see the list. 
And then we have the method of which we'd had that nudge or touch point, text, email, phone, the date, and then who did it. And we have, you know, we have a set group of people who do these things, but it does, as you can see, usually fall mostly um, on me at this point. Okay, so that's sort of our nudge program because what, you know, all the data will show, right? It's one thing to get sort of these high need populations or most vulnerable populations to enrollment, but where the melt occurs, right, is that midway point or after the first year. And, you know, another thing with the nudge program, it's much higher touch that freshman year and then a little less sophomore, junior, and then senior year, the expectation is that they've got it down. It's not a forever, you know, program. Okay. Dot, do you want to answer some more questions now or just, I'm looking at our time, maybe we should keep going and then try to get the, to those yeah. other questions. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, um, AGS is, 60% uh, students of color, and most of those students are African American coming from all areas of our city. And um, I did want to make sure that we reached out to families and show them also options of historically black colleges and universities. So I incorporated events specifically related to HBCUs. Um, and I've done something every year and um, they go out in the newsletter. So these, these invitations are in our weekly newsletter. They're not specific, they go out to everyone and obviously families will self-select in um, because I did not want to you know, send individual invitations and make any assumptions about where families um, line up with their identity. So a couple of different programs that I've hosted now we are in Atlanta and we do have several HBCUs uh, in, in, in Atlanta. So obviously it works really well for me, but with Zoom, um, if you have a population of African-American students, um, you could do a Zoom meeting um, and, and with admission directors, or um, we've also done an alumni panel. So I had an alumna reach out to me um, in December or September and said, you know, I really love to talk about my HBCU experience um, with some other alumni and just talk with current students and families. So we ho I hosted a panel. Um, I actually got her to host the panel and we had some alumni who all chose to um, matriculate to or are currently attending HBCUs to participate. And they had a really wonderful conversation about what it is like to go from a predominantly white institution to an HBCU, why they chose chose the HBCU, what are some of the advantages they see of, of choosing an HBCU. Um, so it offers options. And I, the first event that I did when I got here two years ago, um, I a parent reached out to me and said, I saw in the newsletter and her daughter had already graduated. I saw in the newsletter, I love that you're reaching out and doing some um, specific work with HBCUs. So I just really, I thought that was a wonderful nod um, to the programming. Um, so I of course reach out to the local HBC admission deans and directors for a panel. Um, you may have a local alum black alumni network. I partnered with a local um, alumni network here of, 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 um, of people who had attended HBCUs. So, um, and we also partner with other schools um, to get attendance up. So I don't know if what it's like in your cities, but that's something that we're able to do here um, in Atlanta. And you can advance. Okay, um, with scholarships, um, I wanted to be mindful and I don't, um, I, I don't pick students on my own. There's a there's a team and you, you all probably have faculty teams that you work with when you're trying to decide on those big scholarships, either locally or nationally. Um, and I wanted to make sure that all students are seen. Are, your, are you considering your BIPOC students for the prestigious scholarships? Um, do students self-select based on their interest? Um, is there a faculty committee involved? Um, another question to answer yourself, do you submit names for consideration without school input or do you, input, are you able to uh, really add to that conversation if you have a faculty committee? 
Um, if there's a strong potential candidate and they miss the internal deadline that you, perhaps you have set as the college counselor, um, do you allow them to reconsider? And, you know, I think for every office, you have to discuss, you know, what is equitable. Um, uh, but sometimes um, students don't understand or students in underrepresented ethnic groups or students that are um, BIPOC don't necessarily see themselves uh, in the light of when they read a scholarship description, they don't see themselves. Um, and I have to, you know, just go back and say, hey, tell me why you didn't decide to apply for this scholarship. And do you think that you might want to do it? And let's talk about it. So getting them to open up and having the conversation saying, I think that you would be a good candidate. Um, and if that works for your school, I certainly hope that you can make sure that your pool for those diverse scholarships um, is open to all students um, and that they are seen. I, I remember showing a list to a faculty group and um, I just, the, the same names were coming up and coming up. And then I just threw out, hey, what about this student? And of course they all agreed, but they just hadn't thought about it the first time around. So sometimes I just, for me in, in my role where I am, I have to go that little extra mile to make sure that we see all of our students. Okay, and asking for what you need. Dot, do you wanna begin this conversation about budgeting? You're muted. Sure, as you can see um, from kind of the things I've been talking about, you need to ha start having conversations to expand your budget if the things that I'm saying feel like, wow, we could never do that. Um, and you know, we're gonna give you a little time here to talk about what might be effective within your communities for doing this. Um, I know budgets are tight. And um, identifying you know, other departments to support these students. You cannot do it all. And it's, you know, if, if you're, especially if you're at a school that calls itself college prep, you know, everyone needs to have a hand in supporting these kids to and through. And part of that, you know, is going to be about making this work visible. So it is prioritized by, de by departments other than college counseling and also gets the budget attention that it needs. And so right now, um, we're gonna go ahead and let you be, let you be, put you in <laughs> uh, breakout rooms to discuss these three things, right? So what are sort of the hurdles at, in your institutions to asking for what you need, right? Are some hurdles bigger than others? Who are the people who could really help you move some of these things forward or any other ideas about what you're doing at your school to get the things that you need to support your most vulnerable populations. So um, Nick, if you could put everyone in their breakout rooms now, um, that would be wonderful. And yes, we'll see so you in everybody five. To breakouts, so you'll see them start disappearing. And we'll see you in five minutes. We'll give you a one minute warning. Nick, it did invite me as well. I just want to make sure room seven is not going to be too small if I'm not in it. And I got invited. Uh, well, I, I put you both in room seven, uh, okay. but you are more than welcome to jump and, and join uh, any of the sessions. And Therese uh, and Susie, you should be able to see um, a room invitation you can join in if the attendees that haven't picked accepted the invitation. Okay. So it's just Teresa who is, are you, oh, there we go. Um, Joy, I feel like we're right on time. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so what I, good luck, I'm, I'm looking, but I don't have numbers of the slides, so I'm not sure, I'm a, what slide is this? 20? This is slide 20. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And then we have one more slide after this that's just the Padlet and the, the QA, but I'll go ahead and um, have so many freaking windows open right now. How um, do you think it's going? You know, I, I, I like that questions are popping up in the chat. So that makes me feel like something's landing. Mm -hmm. um, how about you? Um, I mean, I. I don't know. I think it's okay. 
it's really hard when you can't see anybody. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I felt this, I gave a presentation like two days ago and I was like, well, that was awful, <laughs> but I had, but then when it ended, they were like, bye, thank you so much, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> so is that okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, it's, right, it's so also, Sorry to intrude, uh, ladies. Uh, something funny happened. I think some of the folks, maybe because it's almost the, the time, they kind of jump off. So I had to shuffle a little bit some people that were being by themselves. Okay. So I don't know if they're going to rejoin later or just leaving, giving you a heads up. So we have basically eight people left. Uh, oh, but, wow. you know, it could be any issues. I, I actually just got an, on a, on a what do you mean? Eight they could be, I don't know, they had to leave or, or they pressed the wrong thing. Oh. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Oh, okay. Got it. Because that's like half. Right. Yeah. Yes, that, that was weird. So I'm, uh, I'm glad I was keeping an eye on that because I realized people were by themselves in, in a couple of the rooms. Uh, so I added them to a different room. And now we have, like I said, two groups of three and one, people, one group of two. Is the first time I, I I've seen that, but uh, the groups I've done is four or five, so it kind of doesn't really matter. Uh, but with three or two people, yeah, you know, especially if you're in a group of two, somebody falls out or decides it's time to leave, and you have a person by themselves. So well, I kind of shuffle them around. Okay. But um, I don't know what happened. I don't know. I think this does happen. They're not in the call. I think this does happen. Um, it's happened in a parent night I've done before where at the breakout room time, people drop off, especially if it's at the end of a session. Yeah. Um, so that's something to keep in mind for the future. That seems like a lot of people, but you know, there were. Yeah, it, I've seen that this, 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 um, I guess, because of what you guys do, I've seen that people usually join late and they start uh, kind of. Uh, getting out earlier too, because probably they're gonna get, they're trying to get ready, I don't know, for work, for going home. Uh, I don't know how it is, but I've seen that tendency as well with this. All right, so they have uh, 30 seconds left uh, on okay. the three groups that we have. They're gonna come back. Just so you know, I uh, wanna let you know that this internal discussion, it will be removed from the recording. So don't, okay. don't worry about it. Great, thank you. And, uh, and yeah, I apologize about that, I, I don't know, could be the issue. I know from PSDB, I heard that some uh, sectors in the country are having issues with uh, uh, internet. Uh, um, okay, five seconds okay. left. Uh, they should be rejoining soon, so I'll be. And Joy, I'm going to skip past slide 20 just okay. so we have at least five minutes for a QA. and a Okay, go ahead. I think people are back. Okay. Welcome back. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, welcome back. So a couple what you can walk away from the session with, um, we've tried to consolidate it into a Padlet for you. Um, and so I'm gonna share that right now. So it has some of our internal documents that Joy and I have used that have helped us, some links to things like the translation device, as well as um, links to information about scholarships for undocumented students, as well as information about DACA, books, et cetera, et cetera. So everyone will have access to that. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that link in the chat right now. And um, we wanted to just offer this time for a Q&A. So I'm gonna stop share screen so I can actually see who's here um, and just open it up if there are any questions. Quick, uh, is everyone on here a college counselor, a director of college counseling? I see some yeses and some noes, okay. <laughs> if you're not in college counseling, what area are you in? Um, I'm in sort of admin. I'm a former college counselor, so I think about this a lot mm -hmm. and just want to support it from all different directions. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Well, we're going to, oh, go ahead, Nicholas. I have a question, um, and it's it's a little tied to sort of the 
realities of the the moment um, in the the pandemic, um, and I am um, wondering if anyone has suggestions, advice for how um, our most vulnerable students can get a feel for for you know how welcoming and supportive. Um, a college campus actually is for for um, all students. Um, you know, at, at a moment when you can't get on a college campus, you know, um, and and I, I just I'm like, you know, I'm stuck with the virtual resources, and I know they've been made more robust. Um, but I'm wondering if anyone has found like other ideas or or just sort of resources um, to share. Uh, you know, I had a panel, I hosted a panel last night uh, for our students in grades 9, 10, and 11. And I uh, had a couple of admission deans and directors on that panel. And they, this is probably nothing, you know, new. Um, they just said, you know, continue to go to the websites um, frequently uh, to find out more information because they are putting so much out there with virtual resources. Um, I myself, when I was in admission, um, I used to have students um, reach out via email or, or note cards to the prospective students that I met on the road. I have even talked to admission officers and say, hey, can you put my student in contact with a current student who is African-American, um, plays you know, soccer or something like that. So I, I wouldn't mind it being very specific with the admission officers that I know very well. Um, and they could put that student directly in contact with another student. I think that's one, one way to approach that. Did anyone have students who did do kind of a diversity virtual fly-in this fall? No, I didn't either. And, and I'd love to hear from you, Nicholas, like what that student experience was positive. I, ours, our kids, by and large, it was really positive. Yeah, it, it was definitely positive. Um, you know, I, I if I'm remembering, um, I feel like I can't remember what day it is. Um, you know, I, she got, you know, time in a, in a classroom, a virtual classroom, um, perhaps more than one, got to talk to, to, um, you know, current students and she came away, you know, um, excited about the school. So that was definitely, you know, um, as, as, as those programs typically are, it was, it was, you know, a valuable, um, resource for, for her. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. About one more minute, but um, if there's any more questions. I do have um, a question um, kind of about HBCUs and approaching the conversation of the financial aid, right? So in my experience, um, I work in Newark, New Jersey, and all of our students are students of color for the most part, and most of them are have significant high need. And in our experience, we've had a student with perfect GPA, perfect ACT, perfect SAT score, and they have gotten $1,000 um, in a scholarship. And then that trend has kind of just continued on and on. So I'm not sure if there's any um, different approaches to kind of having that conversation with students about, hey, this is a possibility. Um, that this could happen. And then, you know, we've tried and our students are like, oh, you just don't want us to go to HBCUs. And that's not the case. It's of, is it actually feasible for you to be able to afford to go to an HBCU? And are you ready to invest that much in yourself in loans to actually be able to, you know, go? Mm -hmm. Dot, you shared a story with me about a student who Mm -hmm. and HBCU and the financial aid aspect of that? It, it was hard. I mean, I don't have any great, great ideas for you and maybe other people have experienced this, but you know, I had a student go um, to, I wanna say Xavier, New Orleans. Um, and she, I mean, she had a part-time job. She, you know, she had a GoFundMe, she had all these things, but even access to the financial aid office because they were so under-resourced was so limited. 
right? She's like, they're only open from like eight to 10 a.m. and I have class, so I can't even, she's like, sometimes I just sit outside their door and hope someone might come back to pick up something they forgot. Um, and so, you know, it was like endless, endless phone calls for me as well to get to get her financial aid documentation through to even get aid before she started. So I can definitely commiserate with that. Um, I think what you have to find that one contact that seems really connected and responsible and knows your kid, that was what helped in the end is that we called so much that this one person knew us. And that, that was, you know, I, that, I wish I had better advice than that, um, Joy. I, I don't have much to offer either, Jennifer, except making sure that your students apply, you know, early and getting those, those um, like Howard has the, their big scholarship deadline, you know, getting, getting it in early and, and hoping for the best and then finding that, that one person, you know, who is the contact that can get you what you need. So we wish you well on that. We know that it's, it's challenging, yes. So I just want to honor the time. You might be going to another session. Um, thank you so much for being here. The link to the Padlet is there. And then um, I believe we'll add the slides from today to that right now.